name is Mavis Castillo with Above the Call Ministries. I'm the founder and the director right now. I just want to take time just to share with you why God has called me into this ministry. My hopes is today this video will reach you to the deep depths of America and the people that are around that we get to see through our job places with the employees at the grocery store, at our synagogues, at our churches, and in the restrooms, at the movies. The faces of women that are out here in our lives, those that are come from the privileged and those that come from the not so privileged. We all share one common story that there's challenges and we're hurting and there's abuse. I myself have come through what I will call a battlefield. While in the midst of my battle, I knew of God, but I didn't know who God was. I was sitting in the church, grew up in the church, grew up born in Ghana, West Africa from nothing, humble beginnings, to America by immigration through my mom and my father and exposed to opportunities. That gives me a good balance of what, how to live without and how to live with much. And I see the commonalities between a woman that is in the village of Africa to a woman that is living in the projects of Baltimore City to a woman that is living in the penthouse of Manhattan, that they are all hurting. They're all facing their own battles every single day. And they have no voice. Through my challenge of being raped at the age of 16, through my challenge of being married and abused, through my challenge of searching for love in all the wrong places to fill a void that only God could fill, God said he would use me to bring wholeness to women after my third suicide attempt. I thought I could not be seen. I wanted to be invisible. Um, I've always felt like I was the um, outside as a child, outside mm -hmm. child. So um, that's why I think that's why I cling to my grandmother the most because she showed me the most attention. And my mother, because she had met at an early age, wanted to, I guess, capture that use that she missed. Yes. So. A majority of times on the Friday, she would leave. She would come back until Sunday. So I would see her on Sunday afternoon. I needed to be loved. Mm -hmm. So I felt that I wasn't getting getting that or the attention. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the problem. Uh -huh. That led me into thinking that when somebody tell me they love me, it's the truth. Well, um, sleeping around. around, that led to getting pregnant at 13. Mm -hmm. And when um, my mother found out about it, she made me have an abortion. My childhood was very tumultuous. Um, there was a lot of harmony in my home. My parents, I would say, were unhappily married. I believe they loved each other, but they didn't know how to really love each other. So there was a lot of... Uh, verbal abuse, physical abuse. Um, there was never any real harmony. It's just a lot of discord in the home, a lot of cursing, some drinking, and a little drug use. But uh, enough for us as kids to know that it wasn't a normal environment. I remember being about 14. We were living with my mom at the time and she had this living boyfriend that was also very abusive. Um, and there was a lot of physical things that went on, a lot of drinking, and it's still even more drugs. So um, my mom, I remember her calling my dad, telling him to come pick us up for the weekend. And he did. 
So he picked us up for the weekend, but when we returned back to the house, when we returned back to the house, everything was gone. She had just moved. She took the kids that were not my dad's kids and they just left. So I remember coming up on the porch with my two younger brothers. Um, and I just had an eerie feeling when we were returning to the house that something wasn't right. I can't really explain it, but I just felt like something was different. So I remember reaching for the doorknob, I opened the doorknob and I went inside with them and everything was just gone. It just looked like they just moved in a hurry. So I guess it's, you gotta move quick over a weekend. So I became a mom to my siblings um, between the ages of 13 and maybe 15, it's kind of hard for me to pinpoint it. But I do remember in that age range <clears throat> that I found myself doing a lot of things that I thought a, a girl shouldn't be doing. I experienced molestation with a family member that I trusted, that I looked up to. And it seemed like after that happened, I just really just, just isolated myself, I just kind of muscled my way through my life, just doing what I had to do. Um, and I learned at a later age, through, through my sister, that my father wasn't really my biological father. And I didn't find that out until I was 30. Um, so that was really hard for me to deal with, but it also helped me to understand, or it made me feel like I understood why they treated me so differently. I wanted to fade into the into the background but God had his hand on me and everywhere I went he would show me women that I was surrounded by that were in the same pain that I was in and I tell you the greatest thing that drives me every single morning is to get up and say we have women that are saved women that might not even know God. Women that are sitting in churches in high positions, pastors, wives, deaconess, part of the CARES community, and they are hemorrhaging inside because there's conversations that can't be had because we are ashamed. And I am here to be a voice for the voiceless. My childhood was crazy. It was uh, tumultuous. Um, my childhood was filled with abuse, physically, mentally, emotionally. That was mostly my childhood. That stayed with me to my teens because through my whole time, I was up until I was 17 years old, all I did was fight. And I don't mean emotionally fight, I mean physically fist fight people up until I was uh, about 17 years old. Because right. the reason my older sister and us is still tight with mostly all of us because she didn't want to raise us. My mother didn't really raise us. Even though she was in the house, it was my oldest sister who raised us. Um, my mother's always gone, partying, doing her thing, getting drunk. So my older sister was the one home, making sure we had food to eat, making sure things were done, the whole nine yards. Mama just brought home the money, you know, pay the bills. So I want you to hear my heart today, why these women are taking the time out to tell you their story. From their childhood, to their teens, to their adult life, to them spiraling out of control, to marriages, to rock bottoms, to having an encounter with God who is the ultimate, to above the call, to their dedications, and to their next journeys. So growing up as a child and being told that you're dumb and you're stupid and my sister was the smart one, um, yeah, that hurt. That hurt a lot. So uh, that that stayed with me until I was in like my 40s. That stayed with me. 
for a long time. Well, the challenges that I've had when I went out in the street, I got caught up with the wrong people, um, and I started snorting dope, doing cocaine, drinking, and those are the type of people that I hung around with. Um, a girlfriend of mine, I stayed with her when I left home, and those are the companies that I, I kept. I was trying to fill a void that I needed love, and the friends that I were around, I tried to be a part of what they were a part of. And I felt if I did that, then I would be around people. As they unfold, they're digging deep so that you can see America through them today. All various walks of life, but one common thing, they're hurting. They've been traumatized. They've been molested. They've been abused. They have gone through multiple abortions. They have been depressed. They have been suicidal. There are women everywhere that are experiencing this from day to day. And they have become functioning dysfunctionals. To uh, just feel like you really don't belong. I mean, I never really felt like I really fit in anywhere. I can get along with anybody and I could make it work and make it seem real, but I just didn't fit. I just never felt like I fit. I always felt this, just uncomfortable. Like even in my own skin, just no matter where I was, I just never felt comfortable. We didn't go do what they were doing. There was no one really there to do my hair and make me feel like a little girl feels when you put barrettes and ribbons in her hair and buy her cute little things to wear. We, we didn't have that because at the end of my teenage years, I really was living with my dad, so there wasn't a real mother figure in my life anymore. So there was a lot of things I didn't know about being beautiful or being a cute little girl or being a princess. You know, I just was too busy trying to make everybody else feel good. Yeah. Now is the time. Above the call is here to make women whole, not just for themselves, because we are raising a generation of children that are not whole because their parents are not old. Women that are raising children above the call that God has called them to in motherhood, fathers that are absent, and the women that have to hold down the fort. When women are well, the world is well. There is only one entry point into the earth, is through a womb of a woman. And when a woman is broken, when a woman is hurting, when a woman is bleeding on the inside, it travels and it impacts that unborn child. So Above the Call Ministries is here to help these women heal mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. We are not just appealing to you for funds because we want to raise up another shelter to be able to rescue women. I got tired of me. I got, I got, all that time, when you start dealing with yourself and dealing with the stuff that you have done to people, and the whole night, I start reflecting on my life. And I got tired of, I got tired of hurting. I got tired of the pain. I got tired of the bitterness. I got sick of myself. I started not to like myself. I started saying, you know, I don't like myself because the way I was, mean, nasty, bitter, angry Linda. And at first, I enjoyed it until one day I was sitting in church and the pastor was preaching, Pastor Mike was preaching on forgiveness. And I was sitting there and I was like, God. And he was talking about how you need to forgive and let go. And, and he was sitting there, it's like something in my heart just said, I'm done. I'm, I've had enough. Because at that point, I was thinking about committing suicide while I was sitting there. And I was like, what's the point of life? Who can keep hurting like this? Who can go through 
all this pain over and over again. At that point, I couldn't take it anymore. But still, telling anybody, I feel like if I tell somebody, I'd be ashamed. I, I felt like I'm ashamed, like something's wrong with me. I couldn't talk to nobody. I was thinking about, I couldn't even talk to, I mean, when I say nobody, I meant nobody. I just walked around like I was existing, but I wasn't really existing. I was just like a robot, just do my job, do whatever, and come back home and just be miserable. Some of the challenges I face as an adult, um, based off of my upbringing, is things that I'm just really coming to terms with because I didn't know what caused me to be the way that I was. Um, my, particularly in my marriage, I believe for me being molested, It's very difficult for me to be touched. Um, even in my marriage, I have a very loving husband, but he has to be intimate with me in stages. Like, he can't just come in and touch me. He has to, it's like I, I will push him away. I will move his hand, and it'll be a gentle action for him, but for me, it's almost like, invasive you know you're, you're you're entering my space and I'm not I gotta be ready for that you can't just reach out and just touch me intimately um, well my my initial really my initial um, introduction to spirituality actually came from my father's mother my grandmother when we were younger she made us stay in church that's what we did every every weekend we'd end up at her house and you were going to church. So that was just a normal thing for us. Now, I can't really say I felt anything about church in particular at that time other than I was just ready to leave. I was a kid, I was sitting there, you know. Grandma was watching us from the choir pit. And <laughs> my, um, just my feeling about it was, it was just something that we had to do. Um, she got us into reading the daily bread. We had to say prayers every day at Grace, uh, at you know, at our meals, and uh, she was the one that kind of helped introduce me to how to pray at night. I wasn't greatly interested in it at the time, but I will say that was pretty much my my introduction to actually really seeing who God was. I'm appealing to you today because there are many shelters that bring in women, but they never break the cycles of abuse. They never give voices back to their women. They are never breaking chains of generational curses that causes women to go back to the same behavior they have seen all their lives. We break down barriers through authentic and true conversations. We talk about things that hurt. We dig deep and we release them for ourselves, for our children, and for our families. We get the counseling that they need so that they can be able to set themselves free and deal with themselves instead of just being lost in the midst of the cycle. All right. So when our um, pastor came up to me and she asked me, do I think I'll go to heaven? I said, well, I think so. I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm totally a bad person. <laughs> Not that bad anyway, like that. And then she, um, she read the script to me and I received um, Christ then. Amen. And they invited me to their church. Yes. But it took like two weeks before I came. I sent my kids first. And then, then I came. <laughs> and then when I first went, I remember the first sermon was about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And when I sat in there, I started weeping. And I didn't even know why I was crying so bad. I have been searching for love. <laughs> mm -hmm. What else? Trust. Uh, those are two main things. Cause 
for so long I was I just never thought I was slow. Well Linda kept telling me about about the call and I'm like, okay Linda, I'll go, I'll go, I'll come. And I never did and she would tell me the Bible study and how, you know, um, it was changing her life and everything. And of course, I'm happy for her. So I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'll just go ahead and give it a try. Well, Lord behold, I come in here for the first time for above the call and I felt God all over me. I'm like, oh my God, where am I at? What is this? What am I doing? And I felt I felt that I was at a place where God could work on me. I felt that these women were my sisters. I was starting to feel that. I didn't feel that in the beginning because I didn't know them. But I said, okay, I listened. The prayers, the praise and worship, the Bible studies. I felt good, I felt good. Um, I was afraid. I was still afraid to open up because I had so many walls up. And I was like, I don't really know them that well. I don't know if I should tear the wall, let the walls come down. But after a while, yes. I have learned that God can put people in your life that truly love you and that knows God and is not there for anything other than to make sure that God will bring healing, deliverance, restoration, and love into your life. I've learned how to trust again. I've learned how to trust again. We are here offering financial teachings for women that don't know how to manage money, even when they have it, or the reasons why they even stay in abusive relationships because they're afraid of how they're going to be able to support themselves. We are willing to help them connect with employment, to teach them how to be self-sufficient and independent we want to be able to give women utilities assistance for when they are taking care of their families and the funds are just not enough because it's stretched so thin between the schools, between the children, the groceries, the bills, the everyday life. And that BGE bill gets cut off or the water bill gets cut off and they don't know where to go for assistance. We want to be here to be able to provide that for women. We want to be able to bring women home that find strength in themselves to be able to leave an abusive relationship not just for themselves but because of their children that are watching the behavior and they don't want to repeat it for their sake. We want to bring them in and teach them how to have value in themselves, self-esteem in themselves, to be able to trust themselves, to be able to know that love is a very real emotion and you don't have to do anything in order to get it or to give it. In, in a small group, it gives you more time to get to know each other and to talk. Some people need to get connected and feel safe before they open up and speak because of a trust issue. And most women have a trust issue. So if you're in a big group, you may not speak. You may sit there and just listen and wait. That's one of my past problems that I had had. I would sit in the group and wait and see and look at the people and see. If I see something wrong in one, I may not speak. But at the time, sitting there, and you put that toll in there, and you have that time you spend one-on-one, -on -one, then you will start speaking and talking, and you'll discuss issues of life. You will um, want to pray together. You, If something happened that Sunday and you didn't have time, and you didn't get that message clearly, you gain that group, and y'all may bring it up. 
and then some of, someone in there maybe can help you understand. So that's the purpose of small groups and connections. So when you miss it from that group too, somebody will say, have you heard from such and such? You know, somebody's gonna pick up the phone and gonna call, and then when you meet again, or when you're in that group, and you say, well, can you pray for us, such and such? I talked to her, and this is what's going on. And that can go a long way, because it lets you know that somebody cares. It's been exciting, but also challenging, because it, it, it makes me look at myself and who I am and look inside and, and what I need to work on, what I need to deal with, who I need to forgive, what I need to let go of. But I really like it because, because I feel safe. I feel I can say whatever I need to say without somebody criticizing me or looking at me funny. And that's something I always wanted to feel. I wanted to feel safe. I feel like, I feel like if you ever feel safe when somebody hugs you mm -hmm. and they give you a hug, that's how I feel about it by the car. I feel like somebody's giving me a big hug and, and I feel, when I get that hug, I feel safe. I feel wanted, I feel needed, I feel, I feel loved. I don't feel um, rejected. I feel, I feel, that's how I feel about, about the car. Uh, the, the, the gifts that I discovered um, since I came to the Lord, I'm just so amazed at what He's doing with me because I, if someone had told me years back that I would be doing what I'm doing, I would have laughed. I would have blew him off. I would have told him, yeah, okay. But since I came to know the Lord, I'm openly pray for people, which is something that I've always had a hard time with, even when I, when I came to the ministry. I just didn't feel like, like I could pray for anyone, and especially in front of other people. Um, I'm openly talking about the Lord to anybody, even at work. Um, if someone's going through something, I immediately know to go into prayer and to pray for this situation. Even if they mean no, mean me no harm, they could have done things to hurt me, I still know that I have to I have to take it to God and pray and sometimes I have to pray on their behalf. We want women to feel safe. And we have created a small group environment that is an army throughout Baltimore, throughout Dominican Republic, throughout the Congo, throughout Liberia, and we know the needs extends from here on out. We're trying to build a web, a web of network where women can connect all over the world and know that there's somewhere where they can go for refuge. I had my daughter when I was 21. She is the love of my life. She is living her best life. She is doing all the things that I wanted for her, all the things that I didn't have. And I see them coming, you know, into play through her. Just, uh, she's a school teacher. She's working on her master's. She's in her last year working on her master's. She's a new mom. Um, she gave birth to the other apple of my eye, my grandson. Uh, he's about 17 months now. Just watching her grow and stepping into motherhood and being a wife and still balancing her career. And just, I see all the things that are instilled in her, but I see them magnified in her. Like the way that she deals with her child. I was so busy trying to provide for her and make sure she had because, you know, it was just me and her that a lot of times I felt like there were things that I should have done more with her. I should have been more here with her. I mean, I, I did for her and I made sure she didn't want for anything, but the emotional part, I felt like I couldn't really give her that because I I didn't know how to. She knew I loved her just like I know my parents loved me. But you only can do what you know how to do. So to me, their version of love for me was what they knew at that time. So I gave my, myself permission to understand that I gave her all that I had. But she is the joy of my life. And I just know that the thing that she's doing, 
it's not going to repeat the cycle for what I went through as a young girl. So I do, I give God the glory for that. If I was talking to another woman, I would tell them that um, that they the, the experience abuse and trauma in their, in their childhood and, and or, re, or recent, it don't have to be childhood, that I would tell them that God hears you. God sees you. He, he sees the abuse. He sees the hurt, the pain, and everything that you're going through. And He can heal you if you let Him. If you let Him, He'll heal you. You know. Because He healed me. With the small, the culture of the small people environment, I like it because it's intimate. I like it because um, it's small. Because if I feel though it's a big, huge group, I'm not going to say anything because I feel like I'm being closed in. I feel like there's too many people around and my walls gonna go up. But the smaller groups, I feel safe. I feel safety, I feel, I feel loved. I feel like everybody's hearing me. Everybody's seeing me and everybody cares about just what I have to say because sometimes I feel like some people don't, people don't care about what, sometimes I feel like people not listening to me. They don't care about what I have to say. They care about what they have to say but they don't care about what I have to say. So the small groups, everybody's sitting around and talking, it made me feel like they, somebody, I'm being heard. And I'm being seen, I'm being loved. Because I feel loved when I walk through the door. I feel that way. So I'm appealing to you today. Think about some of your family members or friends that have gone through abuse, that are hurting. Those that have lost their battle to suicide and depression. And if you had one more opportunity to be able to do something about it, what would you do different? If you could provide a place where they can go and, and feel safe to connect and feel true, genuine love to help them heal, how much would that be worth to you today? I would say that the gifts that God has given me to advance his kingdom is to be able to minister to other hurting people, um, to feel their pain, to be able to share the goodness of God and what God has done and is doing in my life. Our plan is to have a housing for abused, battered, or oh, different kinds. There are different kinds of abuse and battered. Women with children who have been set out, homeless. I've been that. We can have a place for them to go and help them and teach them how to make it in life, how to get back out there. Because some just have, didn't have training yet. Some need training. Because as with myself, and I'm not trying to go back to myself, but I didn't have, I need to learn financial. I was never taught that, how to handle money. So some of them need to learn that. Some of them need to know how to have self-respect. Some need to learn that, you know. It's, you know, and this, what we will be providing, and some just need counseling. Some have been, like I say, uh, raped, molested, um, beaten, and abused. Um, never, we've had some that have been uh, adopted, don't even know who their, their family members are. We have some women that have been on drugs and um, addicted to drugs, and some still dabbling a little bit, but they're trying to get themselves together. So this is what Above the Call can do. We want to reach these women, whether they're young adults to the, the um, the older woman who doesn't know that she's hurting, but we can reach them. Yeah. God has raised up a mighty network within us that we are helping each other, but it's time for our next level. Every year we go through a dedication after these women have gone through 12 months of in-depth teaching, counseling, one-on-one -on -one services, and digging deep within themselves where they take a journey down an aisle, an act of love and of surrender to a God that hung on a cross for them. You might not be religious, but it's not about that. It's about the fact of faith. We all believe in something.
and we know there is a God that is a creator of the universe, whatever that looks like to you, Hindu, Buddha, Jewish, whatever, Muslim, God only knows one face, and that is his love. We don't discriminate, we're not here trying to put Christ or God on anybody. We're just here to love women, help nurture women, empower women, admonish women, encourage women, build them back up and set them out so they can be good mothers and good wives and good sisters to their communities and their families. And we need your help. Okay, so the C CEOs that are listening or watching, we need you. Um, we have the love, we have the desire, but we need help. It takes funding to build these buildings that we want to build to give people places to go and to live and to be safe, um, to recover from drug abuse or trafficking or any other thing that has caused them to not want to keep moving forward. The, the things that we want to do for them require help, assistance, resources, networking, um, donations, um, anything that you can give that will help us to lift other women up, lift, lift those up that are hurting, those that are homeless, those that have nowhere to go, no family, those that are just feeling lost and unloved. We need your help. We need whatever you could possibly do will be a blessing to this ministry. Right now, we keep it afloat, but we can do so much more with your help. I would say to the CEOs and the founders that right now, there are so many hurting women out there that have no place to go, that are on drugs, that are being abused by men and children out here. We need your finances to open up facilities for these women to go to so that they can be safe and have a place where they know that they're loved and that they know that they'll be able to have a better life for themselves. And we need the finances for that. The dedications are everything to these women. They take vow, vows that they cherish and it stays with them. They understand about giving their heart to a God that will never fail them because life has failed them. Their childhoods have failed them, not to any fault of their own parents, but simply because people only give what they have received. And if you have never received love as a parent, you don't know how to give love. The process that I went through with the dedication of Above the Call was the most wonderful experience that I have gone through in my walk with the Lord. I felt as though that I was getting married all over again and I was getting married to my father in heaven and that the dedication was to love him to obey him and to the best of my ability to walk in the ways and to allow him to help me in the journey that he has me going on. And we teach them how to change the cycle and the trends and the generational mess and turn it into something positive and become models we're raising up leaders, as you heard. You're going to hear through these women how Above the Call Ministries has helped them change their lives. And now they are leading women. Now they're building up women. They are mentoring women. And those women are mentoring women. And we are creating a cycle and a chain that can't be broken. 
because we understand our voice today. I want to thank you to search within yourself for hearing me and my heart and what this ministry will do. God wants to use you to sow a seed, to make a donation, to become a sponsor for us, to partner with us, and to help us to bring so much needed relief to so many hurting and abused women out there. Thank you for your time.